Welcome. I want to make sure that my microphone works and everybody can hear me. Um, welcome to TaxWise Business Ownership. My name is Toby Mathis and I'm going to be your presenter tonight. Those of you who know me, uh, I'm an attorney with Anderson Law Group, one of the partners, uh, and I've written TaxWise Business Ownership. This is actually going to be the third edition that we're about to uh, release. Oops. Uh, you can kind of see it there in the upper right-hand corner. That's going to be the new uh, cover as far as we know. I uh, should have it out here before the end of the year. For those of you who have read it, uh, you know what it's about. It's really about making sure that as a business owner that you're maximizing how much goes into your pocket and minimizing how much you have going into the pockets of those that you don't want it to go into. Uh, specifically, our largest expense as Americans is taxes, and so that seems to be the logical place to start to keep as much money in our pocket as possible is to cut down our biggest expense. And so we spend a lot of time focusing in on making sure that as we uh, operate our businesses that we're doing so in the most tax advantage manner possible. All right. Uh, hey, attention all personnel, due to a recent merger, we will now be known as Death and Taxes, Inc. Uh, kind of a grim look at the IRS. What is the IRS really? You know, a lot of people look at the Internal Revenue Service and they have a pretty negative connotation about what it is, um, what it's all about, and actually what they're there for. And so a good place to start typically is to look at your framework of what our tax system really is. Uh, if I explain to you, or if I explain the tax system to you, where I said, hey, um, you know, you, you get to decide how much tax you're actually paying based off of the rules. You assess it against yourself, kind of like going golfing and assessing the rules against yourself in a gentlemanly way. Um, and about 1% of the time, they're going to come in and look over your shoulder and make sure that you did it right. It doesn't sound so bad. Uh, but most Americans, they look at the tax system and it's something to be feared. Uh, I mean, that's quite deliberate. Uh, Quite often, the Internal Revenue Service uh, is there to put a little bit of fear into us to make sure that we don't get out of line. But if you really looked at the tax system as a whole um, and you looked at it logically, you'd say, hey, it's actually there in, it, in, it, in our, there's a big advantage to us because we're allowed to arrange our tax affairs in such a manner to pay the least amount possible. There's nothing wrong with it. The Supreme Court's already decided that. Uh, and so you, as the taxpayer, uh, get to use the rules to your advantage to minimize your taxes. You're not obligated to pay the most amount required under the law, although they certainly make it easiest to pay the most amount of law. Um, we use in our events the description or the explanation of going to Disney World down in Orlando, where if you follow the signs to Disney World, when you get off, a, you land in the airport and you get in a rail car and you start driving to Disney World, uh, you'll hit just about every toll known to man on the way to, to Disney World, uh, and you'll pay a maximum amount when there's a parallel road uh, that goes to Disney World as well, where there are no tolls. And so the only difference is the locals know about the uh, Sand Lake Road, and everybody else pretty much takes the toll roads. Uh, the tax, tax laws are no different. If uh, The easiest route tends to be the most expensive, and so it takes uh, a little bit of time and energy, but it's certainly worthwhile to take a look at the actual framework of the tax system to get comfortable with it and understand that uh, when you actually become a tax-wise business ownership, not only do you save more money, and this is going to sound really odd to some of you guys, but your chances of audit are cut to a fraction of your individual counterparts. And so on, I'll touch on that. So first off, let's understand exactly where the tax laws come from. They're written by Congress. Uh, they're codified or codified as the Internal Revenue Code. So when you hear about the Internal Revenue Code, um, they're talking about uh, 26 USC and the, the tax laws, it's the United States Code. Uh, the Treasury is the one who collects the taxes uh, when you write a check, you don't write it to the IRS, you write it to the United States Treasury. Uh, they've delegated their collection and policing authority to the Internal Revenue Service. And so the IRS is essentially officer friendly there to make sure that you follow the Internal Revenue Code. Um, what's interesting is you can't even follow the guidance of the IRS. They don't write laws. 
You're not allowed to, if an, if an agent says you don't have to do something, you're not even legally allowed to rely on it. We've had plenty of cases where uh, somebody's asked the IRS uh, agent a question or called in and they've gotten erroneous advice. The only time you're allowed to rely on them is when you get a written opinion, which costs a lot of money. Otherwise, you're relying on the Internal Revenue Code and its interpretation and something called the regulations. You're allowed to rely on those. And of course, there's lots of uh, case law. Uh, the Internal Revenue Code is tens of thousands of pages. It's not something that you want to try to read. Uh, it's kind of like a, there's a field out there and there's lots of landmines. And what you really want is you don't need to know where all the landmines are. You just want to know a safe path through the minefield so you don't get blown up. And that's really what we spend our time doing. And what I've specifically done inside TaxWise Business Ownership is I've wanted to really reduce it down to the basic principles of how do I minimize the taxes? What's the fastest way from A to B? What's the most efficient way from A to B so that you're not harming your business spending time trying to minimize your taxes? So the most important concept when you're looking at uh, TaxWise Business Ownership is to understand that if you are a business, you have a different tax structure. The first one, uh, as an individual, is we earn money, we are taxed on it. If you have a W-2 employer, uh, you would know that they actually withhold the taxes before they give you your check, and then they give you your check, and you spend what's left. Uh, businesses are different. Uh, they earn money, then they spend it in the form of deductions uh, or expenses, and then they're taxed on whatever's left. And sometimes they don't even spend the money. They just become obligated to spend the money and they're still able to write it off. And there's all sorts of uh, kind of creative ways in that in, in, to use tax code provisions to that incentivize certain behavior to get even more money off so that at the end of the day, you're paying the least amount of tax. In fact, uh, in at least one category of business C corporations, the majority of corporations pay zero tax. Uh, and I'm just going to repeat that real quick. The majority of corporations pay zero tax. And if I compared the corporations, the small corporations that compare to a sole proprietorship, the audit rate in most cases is about a tenth of that of its sole proprietor counterpart, which is an individual who's operating a business. Um, so once you realize that the tax code is really written to favor businesses, then you may jump in and start trying to use what are called business structures. And business structures, and I'll give you kind of an overview of them, uh, corporations, limited liability companies, limited partnerships, those are all business structures. They're created by state statutes. One of the big differences between an individual and a business structure, which is considered an artificial person, by the way, by the uh, courts and by the, actually by the Supreme Court, it's already been dictated. This is a, a true artificial person. It does have certain rights. It doesn't have all the constitutional rights, but it has the right to sue, to be sued, to enter into contracts, things like that. So if you think of Microsoft as an entity, it's treated as an artificial person. But one of the biggest distinctions between a person and a business is the businesses don't die. They go on forever. They're perpetual. Another major difference is that in the case of a business, they provide the owners of that business a high degree of asset protection. In other words, since it is an individual, it is considered an artificial person, it would be similar to if you met somebody on the street and they went over and entered into a contract with a third party and breached it, you're not held liable because that third per you know, because that other person entered into that transaction. In this case, you're setting up the business and you may be telling the business what to do, but the business is ultimately entering into a contract. And if it breaches and doesn't have assets to pay, it's the business that's still responsible. So it keeps your assets protected. Now put it in another way, if I was a, let's say a doctor, and I was a fantastic surgeon, I made a lot of money, and I decided I was gonna moonlight as a real estate investor, and I bought one single rental worth $30,000 in a bad area town, and somebody climbed up the stairs on that property and fell through the stairs and was seriously injured or killed, and they sued, if I did not isolate that piece of property into a separate entity, I am liable personally 
for those for that action. And so let's say, and I'll give you guys a real life case. There was a, a situation where there was two window washers who had uh, who were they were electrocuted on a building. They were trying to wash the windows, and, the, and they used an aluminum ladder that hit an electric line. The gentleman on top was electrocuted, and, the, and his buddy tried to, to go save him when he saw what was happening, and he never left the ground. As soon as he put his hand on the aluminum, uh, he was electrocuted as well. Two wrongful death actions of young men with families, m way above liability limits, um, and that individual ended up losing all of their properties and all of their personal assets and going into personal bankruptcy. In the case of a doctor, all their personal assets, including potentially everything that they have in their retirement accounts, could be exposed, as well as they could be garnished for the rest of their life. So one of the main benefits of using a structure, uh, and it's not just for tax-wise, but it's for, you know, it's just for common sense, is it isolates off some of those liabilities. The one that I want to focus on is really going to be the tax planning aspect. Corporations and, and limited partnerships um, are treated differently than individuals. And I specifically didn't mention limited liability companies because a lot of folks don't realize that limited liability companies don't exist in the Internal Revenue Code. You choose how you want it to be taxed. And, I, and that's something that you, you make an election on what's called an SS4. But it could be taxed as a partnership, a corporation, or a sole proprietor. Uh, or just disregarded for tax purposes, as most people know that. Um, but corporations have preferential tax treatment, as do some limited partners. And so uh, a big part of tax planning is knowing what the benefits and drawbacks of these structures are so that when it's you know, useful to you, you use the structure to minimize your tax. Um, let's talk about the business structure real quick. Uh, because just like you and I, when we're born, we have certain documentation that creates us. So are the business. And so for a person, uh, we might have a birth certificate, uh, just like the gentleman to the left has a birth certificate. <laughs> uh, it is a function of the state or not, um, or maybe a certificate of live birth. Uh, but it's a function of the states for people as to, hey, where are you born, that type of thing. And usually you're going to have... Where were you born? What time were you born? What date were you born? Who are your parents? What's your sex? What's your name? Those types of things. A business is no different. It's going to say what state you were born in, um, what date you were born, what's your sex, as in what type of entity are you, uh, those types of things. And it's done via a, um, uh, what actually here is, is, is the articles or certificate of organization or article of organization, depending on your state. And so there'll be lots of little check boxes and things like that where you decide, hey, what is this entity? When is it filed? And you can kind of see on this particular example, uh, if you look in the upper right, you'll see the filing date and time. And that's its little birth certificate. And that lets you know that that, that artificial person has been born. And then it has an evidence, which is this little this seal. And it'll say, you know, in this particular case, it was when Ross Miller was Secretary of State in Nevada. Hey, here's an entity that was created on December 10th, 2012, and this is this is proof that it uh, that it is in existence, so that it was created on that date. And it's this little birth certificate. The next thing you know is, hey, who are the parents? Who who's running it? In other words, hey, who's responsible for this particular entity, or who can we talk to? Mm. And I don't want you to think that that creates liability. In this particular case, we're saying, hey, it's a manager. Uh, and so uh, I'm using the example of an LLC, but this could be a corporation. Uh, it could be a limited partnership. In any of these situations, you have choices. And so we're just designating uh, an individual to be the contact for the state. And, uh, and we minimize how much information in certain, certain cases, we don't want a lot of information out there. In some cases, we do. Like if you're doing a, uh, if you're a, um, a licensed professional, or if you're a real estate professional, or an architect, or a doctor, then you're going to want your name listed. If you're protecting assets, or you have rentals, or you're trying to, you, you have a cash LLC, something that's just holding a brokerage account, you may not want your name registered with it. And so uh, this is where we're putting information with the state, saying, hey, here's the, uh, here's the contact. And this is kind of what's out there in the public record. Now, when I was talking about the taxes, this is the SS4. Just like you have a social security number, uh, the entity would have its 
uh, what's called an EIN or employer identification number, and this is how it obtains it. Since 1997, we've had something called check the box regs. It's called check the box because if you look under line 9A of this slide, there's lots of little boxes and you just check one. It'll say type of entity, check only one box. So that's where the check the box regs come from. It's not more complicated than that. And depending on that, you'll notice, by the way, that LLC does not exist under those boxes. It's not, you know, so often I'll say, how is, how is your entity tax? And they'll say, LLC. Uh, I'll even have that come up with an account and I'll say, an LLC is not a tax designation. It's, it's an entity created by the state, but how are you treating it for tax purposes? Are you treating it as a sole proprietor, as a partnership, or as a corporation? How are you treating it? And so this is where we make that election. And then they send you back, and I say they, the IRS sends you back um, this nice little uh, notice saying, hey, we've assigned you an employer identification number. You, we expect a certain type of tax form depending on the type of business it is. Um, hey, the, this is when we expect it uh, to be filed. So in this case, it's form 1065. So we know it's a partnership and it's due on uh, uh, April 15th. So, so we know, hey, it's, a, uh, it's an LLC taxed as a partnership under that circumstance. So if I see these forms, any good attorney or accountant uh, will be able to tell you, hey, this, I know exactly how you're taxed. Um, going on from there, uh, just like you may have a license in this particular case, hey, we have a, uh, a type of license. We have a Nevada State business license in this case, uh, letting it know that we're transacting business. And then this is a table of contents for the body of the entity. Just like you and I have a physical body, an entity uh, should also have a physical body. And in this particular case, I'm just showing you the table of contents of what something would have. And it's going to be things like, hey, distributions, management, tax matters, the formation, all that stuff gets covered by the, uh, by the body. And so that's kind of step number one. When you're doing, when you're being a tax-wise business ownership is, or a tax-wise business owner, is knowing that there's different types of structures out there and how to use them to your advantage. Or even more importantly, how not to create a disadvantage. If I know that I'm making a, an awful lot of money then I need to know that there's certain entities where it might be a disadvantage to operate or that, hey, maybe I shouldn't be that sole proprietor if I'm making $300,000 a year of net profit. Maybe I should be something where I'm not going to be hit as hard tax-wise. And so that all comes into play. And it goes hand in hand with something called income shifting. Now, income shifting is one of the least used and most effective tax strategies that's out there. Income shifting is based on the principle that where you earn something impacts how much tax you pay on it. When you earn something has an impact on how much tax you pay on it. The easiest example I can give you is if you have a huge year and you have rents coming in in December uh, where it's just going to be piling into a 40 some percent tax bracket, you may go to all your tenants and say, I'm not making you pay in December, pay me you know, two months rent in January. Or if you have the ability to collect on uh, invoices, you may give somebody a longer period of time to pay. Or if you've had a really bad year, or if you have a tax appetite, meaning that you have some losses that you need to eat up, you may give people an incentive to pay you early. It also takes into account the type of income earned. There's a difference between if I receive rental income or if I'm making W-2 income or active income. It also matters who earns the money as opposed to like, hey, which entity? You know, there's a big difference. The easiest example I can give you is if I make money inside of an IRA versus if I make money in my own name. If I make money, let's say a Roth IRA, and I'll give you another real life example, uh, individual who was setting up a company had a lot of um, stock, a lot of stock options, and when they were setting up the company, those that, that stock may not have been worth a ton. Um, maybe they were contributing it to a Roth IRA um, and you know purchasing those shares in the company. 
Uh, and then eventually when that company goes public or as it takes off, those shares become worth a lot more. Um, where does that money get taxed? If it's inside the Roth, guess what? They're not being hit personally on uh, with the tax. If it had been in their name, they would have had a sizable gain that would have hit them um, that they would have been paying tax on that they wouldn't have been able to, to, to uh, really do anything about. Um, also being able to control when you get the income, how you get the income, uh, when you spend income or where you spend income, all of those things, when you can control it, now we are able to do some serious tax planning. And for those of you that have their own small businesses, um, especially traditional businesses, uh, you know this is true when you're sitting down with your tax advisors to do your year-end tax planning. Quite often they're saying, should we pay out bonuses? Should we pay an additional mortgage payment? Hey, should I buy equipment that I'm going to need next year now? So I can take a, you know, do I have an extra 179 deduction if I have a, that's an equipment deduction where I don't have to depreciate, um, you know, last year, uh, 2014, uh, we had a $500,000 limit. This year we have a $25,000 limit under section 179. So a tax wise business owner would have been sitting there at the very end of last year saying, Hey, I have a small window to buy equipment where I can get a immediate deduction as opposed to depreciating something over five, seven years. Um, so those types of things are, you know, is what you're going to be having a discussion with, with your accountant. Um, here's some examples. Let's say that you have a business, a corporation, and there's you, there's your kids, there's the pension. All of these things come into play when you're doing income shifting. So um, in my case, uh, I have a daughter who's going to college. And if I go ahead and I pay her tuition, I'm going to be paying it at my tax bracket as opposed to if I have her working for one of my companies and earning money, then I can pay her and have her pay for her tuition at her tax bracket, which is going to be considerably less than mine. For those of you who have kids that are, you know, 20, 21, 22, going to college or whatnot, uh, this is another situation where it's like, hey, it's better to have them earn the money and work with my company than it is for me just to give them the money. That's called income shifting. I'm shifting the income off of my tax bracket to my child. Or if I have a brokerage account and I'm being and it's being managed by the corporation, quite often, for example, there's things I cannot deduct in as a as a as an investor in the stock market. Uh, for example, the big one is, I, hey, I can't go to classes, I can't go to seminars, I can't go to conferences, I can't write off my travel, I can't write off it, the education of trying to learn how to adequately trade. I don't know why, but they specifically exclude it for investors. But a corporation that manages a portfolio, that manages an LLC that holds the account, is allowed to deduct it. And so that's a situation where you're saying, hey, it's better for the corporation to incur that expense than it is for me. I'm not allowed to write it off, whereas the corporation can. Um, even a better example is corporations, specifically C corporations, can reimburse 100% of medical, dental, and vision under a 105 plan. Um, and so in other words, in English, that means that it can pay for anything that comes out of your pocket, co-pays, um, uncovered procedures, even if you have to pay for your own insurance. Uh, a lot of times employers pay for the employer, the employee, but then the family, they're paying with after-tax dollars. They're deducting it out of your pay, but you don't get a deduction for it. Uh, here, the corporation could reimburse that 100%, write it off 100%, and you don't have to receive, uh, it's not taxable to you. So there's another situation where maybe we want to drive money into that corporation. It makes sense. You see the pension sitting over there. There's another situation where we might be able to get something into a tax deferred arena. Let's get money into that pension, either by having the corporation, if it's paying you or your child a salary, let's dump it in. Or better yet, if you're paying your kid a salary, maybe they should be putting money in a Roth IRA. Maybe they should be putting money, maybe you should do a, uh, an executive benefit plan and having that corporation 
dump money into a non-qualified retirement plan or a 7702 plan for your kids and yourself. There's plenty of ways to shift income around and get benefit. It's just knowing that it exists and making sure that you have the structures in place to take advantage. So something as simple as this, where we have really just a retirement plan and a corporation and you uh, and, and your children, just your family, and we have a lot of opportunities for some tax planning. Um, income shifting. Here's a big one. Um, and this is specific to rent, licensing, and leasing. Uh, let's say that, uh, and I'll give you my situation, uh, in our firm, we have our, um, our, our business itself, the law firm, and then we have um, real estate. We have a couple, we have a building, we have a floor of a building that we own, and we rent it for fair market value. We rent it, but we hold those buildings outside an LLC. Why is that important? It's important because rents, royalties, lease payments, licensing payments, all those things are passive, which means they're not subject to old age and disability, which is 12.4%, and Medicare, which is 2.9%. So uh, it, it, it does make a difference um, as to how we get that money. I, I was talking to a client earlier who uh, were looking at getting intellectual property outside of their business so that it's not in the firing line of lawsuits uh, but, but even better yet, it's because uh, if we're licensing that intellectual property for a reasonable amount, they're getting consistent passive income as opposed to having to receive uh, active income all the time. For somebody who is in the $70,000, $80,000 range or $100,000 range, this can save you 15.3%, especially if you own the company, you're paying both halves of the self-employment tax. Um, you know, that ends up being a pretty sizable amount. And I have some slides later where I'm going to show you exactly how big of a difference it makes to have income that is not subject to self-employment tax as opposed to income that is. Um, how about income shifting, just getting money into the QRP, a qualified retirement plan, where the business pays you and can put 25% of your salary or whatever it pays you in salary and dump it into a retirement plan. Um, an interesting concept and something that my partner Clint Coons teaches quite often is you can have that QRP owning a piece of property that you're partners with. So let's say that you have a piece of rental property, um, but did you know that you can allocate 100% of the losses and the depreciation to yourself as an individual so it's not stuck in the retirement plan? Uh, let me just repeat that in case it just blew your mind. Yes. Because it's an LLC and because we have control with the operating agreements as to how the uh, profits uh, are allocated and losses are allocated, we could choose to have the losses allocated to you as an individual as opposed to allocating them to the qualified retirement plan where they'd be virtually lost. And so you could actually partner with a QRP where you're getting all of the depreciation on a property. Oosh, I just heard a couple of brains explode. Um, the other thing that you can do, and another thing that my one of my partners likes to talk about, and that's Clint Coons and Greg Boots, is you can actually purchase life insurance, including IULs and whole life, inside of a qualified retirement plan. Uh, why would you do that? It's deductible. That's why you do that. Uh, there's a small taxable amount for the term value, what's called a PS58 amount, but you can still put monies into that QRP and there's ways to get that policy out later on uh, for less than uh, less than what you know what you think to get a pretty big value out to yourself um, and again it's just running numbers and then all of a sudden a, a whole bunch of different worlds open up once we have these structures in place um, I like this cartoon because I believe it's true the internal revenue code is absurdly complex or as we lawyers say, a gold mine. Yeah, the more complex, the more confusing, sometimes the better. There's lots of provisions I could give you, 280A subsection G, subsection two, where you can rent your house to your corporation uh, for 14 days a year and not have to recognize the income, get to, do, get to completely deduct it on the corporate level. That's one of those examples, uh, just, just using some of the qualified retirement plans or better yet using section 7702 and never paying tax again on a non-qualified retirement plan. Those are just some examples. Um, 
let's go to the real basic. And this is, you know, sometimes keeping it simple is going to be the best way and using what's tried and true and what's the lowest lying fruit is going to reap the biggest reward. Deduction. Using business deductions. A deduction is any item or expense subtracted from gross income to reduce the amount of income subject to tax. In other words, in English, if I make a dollar and spend a dollar, I have zero taxable income. It's making sure that those things offset. Um, the number one thing you can do as a business owner to maximize these things is to document your intent. And the reason I have a Starbucks coffee is I like to do these at events especially is I talk about uh, the reality of business deductions and what it really means to intend to be doing business. And so if I, as an attorney, as a speaker, uh, am invited to go to New York and somebody says, hey, come out to New York on the 3rd uh, and speak for a day on taxation for real estate uh, dealers. And I say, okay, I will fly out to New York on the 3rd I'll be there uh, coming on the night of the second. Um, I will um, speak and then I'll leave on the fourth. Am I allowed to do that? Yes. Uh, and I fly in, I get there and I show up on the third and they look at me like, you're a month early. I say, what do you mean I'm a month early? I'm here on the third. And they said, oh, not this month, next month. Am I allowed to write off my expenses for going on that trip? The answer is absolutely. My intent was to conduct business. So it's regardless of whether or not it actually took place, I am documenting my true intent. So why do I have a Starbucks cup? So if you are a Starbucks aficionado, and I'm from Seattle, so I tend to, to like to uh, use Starbucks as the example because I was... Uh, remember the original location on, on the public market. It's just a little hole in the wall. Um, but if you went there to get your caramel macchiato frappuccino with nutmeg and, and whip or whatever it is, and you paid 20 bucks for your drink, and I see somebody there, and we get together, and we, 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 we sit, decide we're going to sit down and talk about uh, good old days and all that, and then we get into a business conversation. The question is, can I write it off? I talked about business 90% of the time. The answer is no, because when I sat down, my intent was to have a personal conversation or I didn't really intend to have a business conversation. Now let's say I call up uh, a lawyer to say, hey, I want to discuss a contract and let's meet at Starbucks. Uh, I'll buy you a ridiculously expensive drink and uh, you can give me some great sage advice on contracts. I may even pay you for your time and we show up and I get there and I say, uh, you know what, I, I, I intended to talk about this contract, but you know what, I've just got some personal issues I just want to share with you. And we end up talking about the good old days and some other stuff. Can I write that off? Absolutely. The reason being is that my intent was business. It may not have occurred the way that I had perfectly intended it, but taxpayer intent is oftentimes controlling. I want to make sure that I'm documenting my intent. Who decides whether or not you're documented, uh, your intent is documented? The answer is going to surprise you. It's actually you do. And uh, this isn't something that you have to have in a complete legal form. This is something where, um, frankly, uh, it, as long as you're keeping some record, it could be in your Outlook calendar, the who, what, when, where, and why, as long as I can figure that one out, I'm going to be able to um, keep track of my intent and document my intent, especially if it's in a business calendar. For example, in my case, I use an iPhone. I have my, I use a Google calendar and I put everything on there and it's my work calendar. I have a personal calendar also. If it's on my work calendar, what does it presume to be? I know that I'm using it for work. And so I'm going to relate it to something I do track. I have an electronic CRM system where I can track my conversations and stuff like that. Uh, for those of you who are low tech, it's just keeping a notebook or something or keep a receipt, draw who, what, where, and why on the back of it, just kind of make a notation. There's, a, there's no right or wrong way necessarily. It's just being able to show what your intent was. What was the business purpose? Um, here's a wonderful one. After federal, state, and local taxes, you get one-third of a wish. 
um, hey, I'd take that action is better than no wish, right? All right, so what are the most common mistakes that we see with business owners? Uh, one of the most common mistakes that I see is to fail to structure things appropriately. Unfortunately, I see these things 10 years, 15 years, 20 years plus after they should have been structured the right, the right way. And when you explain to somebody how much they've been overpaying, and I had a, you know, I'll give you a great example. I had a high end client who was making in the neighborhood of $150,000 net profit every year, had been for the better part of 15 years. And I just explained to him, why weren't you set up as an escort? He was operating as a sole proprietor the whole time. Really wasn't using a retirement plan. Just didn't know. He had an old school accountant who didn't believe in all this newfangled stuff. And the amount of money he was leaving on the table was staggering. And when I added it up, um, in many cases, it was over $10,000 a year over, over, you know, just over 10 years plus interest, plus loss of opportunity, the income that would have been earned on it. I mean, we're talking close to $200,000. And this is somebody who's looking to retire and they're just a little, you know, how far away are they from their retirement? You know, less than that. And when the reality hit them, you could just, it was like the air got knocked out of them. And all of a sudden you realize the failure to plan literally was costing them another two or three years of employment where they, they wouldn't have had to do it otherwise. Um, so I, you know, again, some accountants are well-intentioned, but, you know, boy, it really does pay to sit down and, and, and map these things out. So here's an example. Somebody who's making $100,000, just call it 100 grand. And uh, we start calculating out uh, how much are they going to pay in self-employment tax. This is an actual 1040. And I just highlighted line 57. For those of you who have your 1040s, you can actually go look at this line and see. This is the, this is the tax that nobody really pays attention to because it's not federal income taxes. This is in addition to federal income tax. On line 56 is the federal income tax, and you'll notice that the self-employment tax is almost as much. It literally doubles their tax, yet all we ever talk about is the federal income tax. One of the biggest taxes, the largest taxes, most expensive taxes is that self-employment tax. So here we go. You're looking at it, you add that up, 30000 dollars in tax, 14, 130 of it was in the self-employment tax, total amount of tax they're paying when you add it all up. Um, the amount that they owed was 31, 231. It was just a pretty heinous year. That's a third of the money that they're making. A third. You just look at it, $100,000, 31,000. That's without state taxes. That's without it. It's just ridiculous. Now we go in and we structure it differently. We structure it with an S corp and we pay ourselves W2 income. So we have no self-employment tax because we're no longer self-employed. We're working for an entity. And you look at the amount of tax that was paid. In this case, we have 18,341 being paid. Um, what's the difference? 31,000 versus 18,341, about $12,890, or roughly 12 percent of your total income. Um, that's a pretty big amount. I've seen people that would climb over glass for 10 percent returns on their money, yet here they are. People will willingly give away 13 percent of their income without batting an eye because somebody told them that it's too easy or it's too hard. Oh, it's not for you. Um, hey, it doesn't make sense, and they'll 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 listen to it, and they'll they'll take that advice, and they'll just they just don't know better than to argue against it or to try to push forward. So one of the, I guess one of the lessons I would say to be a tax wise business ownership is really educate yourself, so that if you happen to have one of those accounts that's uh, still living in the day where they use an abacus, I'm just being facetious. Nobody really uses an abacus; they're probably using a calculator, uh, probably a solar calculator. I'm really being ridiculous, um, but they they do have the, you know, you have the old school accountant that just doesn't understand the use of business structures or they believe that they're super difficult. Uh, these are folks that were usually in practice prior to 1997 when the rules were simplified, 
when you didn't have all the hoops to jump through to qualify. But if they learned in school that it was difficult, it's really tough to get over that mindset. It's, it's, if I told you to fill in the blank for me and I said, close the door, were you born in a blank? Uh, most of you guys are going to say barn. It's already, it's already inside of you. Or uh, don't talk to, you guys are going to fill in the blank, strangers. If you listen to that inner voice, which is telling you these things, um, for example, if you were a salesperson and you listen to that voice that says never talk to strangers, you'd be uh, the world's worst salesperson, right? Uh, you'd never talk to anybody. Uh, you'd never make a sale. So we have these inner voices in us, and quite often these accountants have been brought up, and they have those inner voices, and they subject them against their account to their clients, and the clients have been raised to believe, just follow the professional. The professionals are super smart, and they know so much. No, sometimes the professionals don't know so much. They may know a few of the rules. Uh, use them in, by educating yourself so you can use them so they don't use you. And uh, using you, this is a great example of you being used by the professional, making their life a little simpler, uh, but your life a lot more expensive. And I think if, if you went down to it and you said, hey, I know it might take you an extra hour to file a return or maybe two, two hours, and yeah, there might be a little added expense, but for $12,000, I think it's worth it. Uh, they'd be real hard pressed to uh, deny that. The other most common mistake that I see is when people lump all their activities into either a sole proprietorship or uh, a lot of times people hear about an S corporation and they'll, they'll think that's, uh, you know, they'll go to a professional who plays one key on the keyboard, uh, meaning that they learned what's the best entity and that's what they always go back to because they were taught that's the best entity. It's like lawyers that say use a will in estate planning. Um, no matter what, I actually, true story, I sent a relative to a, an attorney in the South to get a power of attorney for health care, and the attorney drafted up a will for him. When they heard power of attorney or anything that involved estate planning, um, they immediately went to will because that's what they were taught. Everything's a will. So when the relative went in for surgery and they ended up having a question, the doctors had a question in the middle of the procedure, they, didn't, they, they weren't allowed to ask or they weren't allowed to rely because they didn't actually have a power of attorney in place. Very frustrating. Nowadays, most people know enough. The internet's so good where they're able to get the information that they know about living, uh, living trusts and power of attorneys for healthcare, HIPAA releases, all those things. It's pretty common knowledge. So people know, hey, that's what I want to use. Um, in the tax field, you still have a little bit of the uh, old mentality where they're looking for the best solution. So back in the day before the Bush tax cuts, the taxation of a C Corp was it was taxed at the corporate level. Then you would pay uh, shareholder ordinary income uh, tax on it as well. And so it was a bit of a p punishment. Nowadays, it's the corporation pays a tax on it and then you pay it at your long-term capital gains rates or dividends, uh, which are at long-term capital gains rates. So um, quite often, if you're at a, anything under $100,000, it may make more sense for you to be a, a C Corp. But again, some of these folks are just stuck in their head. Hey, everything's an S Corp, everything's an S Corp. And then they'll lump it all into that one entity as opposed to considering just for two seconds, maybe I should play a chord. Maybe I should take my rental property that is that, that the business exists in and, and separate it. From an asset protection standpoint, that makes absolute sense. From a tax standpoint, that makes absolute sense, yet that'll never occur to them because they're still thinking, I can only pick one. And you say, no, maybe maybe I need to put it all together. And so when you lump it all in one, you lose the distinction between that passive versus active. active. Uh, same things with real estate. If you are flipping properties and investing in properties, guess what? You get to be labeled as a dealer and you lose your ability to have investments. You lose your ability to have 1031 exchanges. You lose your ability to have installment sales. You, you end up with old age and disability and Medicare and real estate activities because you lumped it all in one and you, became, and you made it into an active endeavor. You can only be one on, a, on, on an activity. So um, 
we want to separate these things out so you can have different taxpayers being treated differently. And sometimes they flow down under your 1040. And even though you're getting the benefit, you have to remember that the way that the courts look at it, the way the IRS is that there's, sep there's an artificial person out there making that money. You, maybe that it's pointed at you and it's flowing down under your return. But so long as you respect that separate entity, they will respect that separate entity. Um, the other example is if you have equipment, a lot of heavy machinery or something like that. A lot of folks, again, uh, construction companies are notorious for this. They'll throw it all in there and leave it exposed, uh, both from an asset protection standpoint, but also they're missing out on the opportunity to get passive activity that's not subject to the old age and disability and Medicare and give themselves a little benefit there. The other most common mistake, and believe it or not, is people forget to deduct. I used to be surprised. Now I'm just like, I'm, I, I just expect it. But I would run across people that were in-house controllers or accountants for third parties, and they are looking for everything for their employer to deduct. They are, you know, hey, I want your expense report. They're looking for anything that's not nailed down to, to throw into office supply or whatever. Hey, how can we write it off? And then they go home and they may have their side business and they don't deduct anything. And they just say, well, it's, you know, I'm not a big business. It doesn't matter. The difference between a company that's making 100 million and a company that's making 1,000 is zeros. The same rules apply. And so by forgetting to take something as a deduction, you're leaving a lot of money on the table. When you have to earn money, then pay tax on it, and then pay with what's left over, just at the most simplest sense, let's say that you're, you're, you would make $2,500 to spend $1,750. If I was a business, in order to, to, if I needed to buy something worth $1,750, let's say it's a laptop, I just have to make $1,750. I can expense it immediately. A lot of us, even with our businesses, will still go out and they'll buy a laptop and they'll say, yeah, but I use it for some personal use. Okay, it's a business laptop. Are you using it for business? What's your intent? Well, yeah, I need to use it for business. I take it on the road and this, that, and the other, but I also play solitaire on it. Okay, if, if, if you were using it some personal use, then allocate a portion of it for personal use. Otherwise, frankly, the IRS doesn't care. They're looking at it saying, is it a business purchase? Yes. Do people play solitaire at the office? Yes. Okay. If you buy a cell phone, are you using it for business? Is that why you're getting it? For real estate folks, I, you cannot function with a landline anymore. For most businesses, they can't. Use and, 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 and write off the cell phone. Other little things, um, fun stuff, like without even, uh, without even getting into a bunch of deductions, it's putting things on a, on a business credit card, um, writing them off, but also getting those points. The points off the credit card are not taxable. You can use those. You can buy things with them. They're not taxable to you. They're not a taxable benefit. All those little things, a lot of times we forget and we say, gosh, you know, this is really kind of personal. You know what? Go out and do it. Even if you have to reimburse the business, you still get an ancillary benefit. Uh, don't forget to do those things. Or if you're driving around in your car for business, it's 57 cents a mile. Track it. Write it down. Write it off. If you don't, you're literally throwing a dollar bill out of the, the window every few miles. It's, you're just burning money. And so sometimes people just forget and they just don't think it's worth their time or they don't think that they're entitled to it. They don't think that, that they rise to the level of a business. And I say, just get that out of your head. Um, the old adage I have is when is doubt deduct. Um, Deduct it. If worst case scenario, if you're if you're documenting your intent and the IRS comes in and an auditor and just understand an auditor's there is a calculator. They're just trying to determine what the tax is and they deny you a deduction. The next step is negotiating it with the uh, internal office of appeals. The auditor cannot negotiate. So all they're saying is, is it more likely than not this would be considered a business expense? If it's on the cusp, you know, even if it goes against you, you're going to be negotiating that. And that's a great position to be in. Hey, here's my argument. 
These are human beings. They just want, you know, quite often they just want to show that they get a little bit of a win. I've never seen a situation where they're saying, you know, they're just playing hardball and denying all deductions. And I've been through some super audits myself. We were one of the uh, companies under a random, completely random payroll audit where they come in and they went through everything with a fine tooth comb. At the end of the day, the auditor, even though he had the wet fish grip and, the, and the, he literally had short sleeve white shirt, uh, he was a caricature of an IRS agent. He was still pretty reasonable. At the end of the day, he kind of looked at it and was just trying to figure out, yeah, maybe this, no, that. He was not just trying to cram it down our throats. What they're looking for is just making sure that you're substantially complying with the laws. All right. Any questions rolling around out there? I'm trying to see if there's any questions on the screen. I'm really not seeing it. I'm going to see if I can't find another um, spot where maybe they're showing. I'm just not seeing it on mine. Uh, let me see if I can find one other spot. Um, okay, and see if I can see anybody's questions. Unfortunately, I'm not seeing questions. I'm going to try to, I'm not going to be able to get in there. So um, I don't see any questions from any people. So that being said, that is the presentation. If you have questions, you can email me. It's T Mathis at Anderson Advisors, T Mathis at Anderson Advisors dot com um, or ALG Law or any of our emails. Uh, check back often to our website and make sure that you continue to attend these uh, these webinars because every little bit of knowledge helps in making sure that it's just another tool in your toolbox to minimize the amount that you have to pay. At the end of the day, it's your money. It's not the IRS's. It's not your accounts. It's not your attorneys. It's your money. You have a lot of say in how much of it you keep. Um, so just make sure that you're just acting as a tax wise business owner. Hopefully before the end of the year, you're going to see it republished. You get to buy it. Typically we sell it, uh, $29.95. I'll see if I can't get a special, um, uh, version out that comes out before we publish it available to our clients and to our newsletter subscribers. So keep on the lookout for that. Uh, and until next time, this is Toby Mathis from Anderson Law Group. Thanks.